In my book Affirmations, I talk about a concept called variance. I'll just discuss it here for a few minutes as it really talks to the essence of a positive reversal of self. Variance is the gap between what you pretend to be, what you think you are, the mask or persona that you present to the world, and what you actually are. You could say that variance is a tape that measures the height of your ivory tower. All great spiritual journeys and the path of the initiate leads towards an ego death, a place where you become aware of the variance and then the tower falls in front of your eyes. The authentic you has enormous power. When you join it and become the same as it, a synapse of energy takes place. It's a burst of light caused by a sudden fluctuation in the quantum field. This is vital to your enlightenment. If you don't collapse the illusion voluntarily, it is eventually collapsed for you. If you can control the collapse gradually, it's much less painful than when it comes upon you in a fast hurry imposed from elsewhere. Let me explain. The reason why people feel blank and hopeless and in despair at this time is because they don't have the power of their own soul to drive them along. It is as if the real you is locked away held prisoner in the tower by the phony you. I don't know if you've ever felt that there was something terribly wrong, something missing in your life, a splinter in your mind, as Morpheus says in the Matrix film. The missing bit is in the mirror world. I'll talk a lot about that in the course of this series. There's another you, the feeling you, that is formed by the subconscious mind. It is the storehouse of your dreams. It is the authentic you. It is the perpetual memory of you, your soul. Once you come back and retrieve it, suddenly all sorts of creativity and possibilities come from within you, and you have the opportunity to garner real worth in your life. Sure, that might be a nice money-making idea, or it could just be newfound friendships and a sense of belonging. Abundance is not necessarily cash. It's the warmth of humanity and animals around you. It's service to mankind and it is being served. It probably wasn't really your fault. We are driven by fear and inadequacy and bad luck and poor choices. We are driven by many factors. This is not a level playing field, and so you should not be too harsh on yourself and others. Do this. Get a little notebook, one that you can slip into your purse or your pocket, and start over the next few days to jot down all the things in your life that make sense and the ones that don't. You are looking to notice the variance between what you have to do and what you really feel about it. Some of it will be obvious and you know it's phony, and some of it is more obscure. It'll only dawn on you as you think about it, and as you ask of your super-knowing to show you. You have to be fair with yourself and compassionate. You can't cheat on yourself, telling yourself lies, as that is a variance of its own, isn't it? Draw a line down the center of your little variance booklet and put true on the one side of the center line and not true or partly true on the other. Your job or business, do you like it? Are you fulfilled or do you hate it? Home, is it fulfilling and supportive or is it a nightmare? Is it where you want to be? Can you afford it? Relationships, are they supportive or draining? Money, are you sensible and honest or irrational and dishonest? Lifestyle, is it healthy and sustaining or unhealthy and destructive? If it's destructive, it's probably your inner shadow trying to kill you. Are you brave enough to look at that and set yourself free? Or will you remain a victim? Can you love yourself, lumps and bumps and all? Time management. Are you rushing about with very little time for yourself? That is a variance of its own, one that you should look at. Then you look at if you really care about delivering your soul to a new redemption. Perhaps it doesn't really bother you. Perhaps you feel you're already perfect. Such thoughts are a trap. Remember that. Then ask, how do you relate to others? Are you distanced from humanity? Do you really care for them? Is it all about you and what you want in this lifetime? Or are you aligned to the needs of others? How much love do you offer? And how much silent resentment and hate? Are you an angel in disguise or a hidden predator? Are you stingy or generous? Are you open and accepting, or closed down and dogmatic? Do you cast a kind eye to everyone, and a deep sense of justice and acceptance, live and let live, 
or are you judgmental and cruel towards others? The way to work this out is this. Think about someone you don't really agree with, and then ask yourself if you respect them anyway. Do you care for their humanity, even if you don't like them? Do you care for their soul, even if you virulently disagree with their opinions and their actions in life? The reason why this type of equanimity is vital is that in the mirror world, any kind of judgment or antagonism will soon take your spirit down. It's a bad trait to find fault in others and to denigrate them and make them wrong. You eventually want your life to be seen as proper and right. How will you do that if you don't offer that to others, if you've always made them wrong? Taking an equitable stance towards humanity is the only safe way to go across to the mirror worlds. And finally, here in this opening discussion on reversal, can I ask you a really difficult question? Are you grateful? I mean truly grateful, or do you just pretend? When you say thank you, do you mean it from your heart, or is it just a social thing, fobbing people off? Are you actually relating to someone's soul and acknowledging them for their work and their kindness to you? The reason I ask is that I've noticed that much of the time people are not grateful at all, and they don't even bother to say thank you properly. They just expect to be sustained, but they can't acknowledge the goodness that's come to them from others. Sometimes I think they feel that they're owed a living in this life, regardless of how little effort they put in. Gratitude is important. It goes hand in hand with humility and softness. Do you see how spooky and wonderful it gets real quick? If you do this right, it'll make you cry because you'll see the darkness of it all. And once you see it and once you own it, your life will dramatically change. I promise. I've seen thousands of people go through this and some of it was tears and compassion and moments of heaving emotion. But at the end, they came out light and angelic and forgiven and liberated. The greatest gift you can offer yourself in this life is to redeem yourself. Once you agree to stop running away from yourself, you'll be free, and then you'll be able to see it properly. I've never seen instant absolution, instant redemption. All there ever was, what could be described as a gradual climbing out of a dark world of variance and confusion and fake ideas towards the spiritual, authentic world. You don't need to beat yourself up. It's okay to screw up, that was your karma and other people's karma. But you just have to look and see and accept all those aspects of who you are, the nice bits and the horrid bits. Let's review a few more ideas of reversal. Life can be scary, that can cause fear. The natural reaction is to become more aggressive and more yang towards others. But eventual safety and a higher perception lies in the power of softness. Some know this already, but you may not always embrace it. It isn't obvious at first. The ego feels that the more threat it offers, the safer it will be. But that's not so. It doesn't seem obvious at first, but the more aggressive you are, the more the hard forces come against you. So spirituality is a measure of how soft you can become, not what rules you follow. It seems strange, but in establishing a spiritual softness, you come to the first of three liberations. Each is an emotional release and a huge spiritual advance. With this audio series is a guided meditation. It's a quiet session of prayer and introspection. It takes you to the three liberations, so you can go there any time and work on them and process them more and more. They are vital. You cannot proceed without them. The energy of the world is rapidly shifting. Your life will become ever more problematic without these perceptions. The first liberation is you have to agree to make peace with the world. What I've talked of in this session so far is an unobtrusive attempt for you to make peace with yourself, to turn yourself round and go the other way. Now you have to go beyond the story of your life and evolve beyond it. That is the enlightened way. 
To learn to forgive yourself for some people is very, very hard. But again, it's because they make such a story of everything. I know people that have gone into inner child therapy who 10 years later, they're grown 40-year-old women, millionaires, some of them, and they're still whinging on about their inner child and their mother was inadequate and their father was a drunk. Let it go. You know, let it go. You have to go into an act of contrition. You have to observe the mistakes you made and have an act of contrition over it, you know, where you genuinely feel sorry. You don't just fob it all off with, ah, well, sorry about that. You feel sorry. Then you go into atonement. And atonement is where you attempt to make good with the people that you've hurt. But if you can't, because they don't live here anymore, so to speak, then you atone by being kind to other people. So the first thing is awareness, the second thing is attrition, the third thing is atonement, and then beyond that, it's transcendence, you leave. In other words, you're not callous, you're not shrugging and saying, ah, well, that's it. You completely comprehend where you made mistakes, and you're sort of embarrassed about the fact you did make those mistakes. But in the higher knowing, in the sort of super knowing, you understand I'm weak. So today I affirm that I won't make the same mistakes again, or if I do make the same mistakes, I'll try to make littler ones. You understand that when you made those mistakes, you really damaged other people. You hurt their feelings. And so you feel sorry for the fact you hurt them. You don't want to hurt them, you want to raise them up. And so you attempt to atone in whatever way you can atone, and then you transcend by reviewing it properly, atoning as best you can, Creating this act of contrition, which is the act of saying, look, I'm not going to do this again. I realize I've really hurt people here. And then allowing yourself time to just walk beyond it or go beyond it to higher and better things, which kicks into the idea of service. You know, how will you serve? Because in service, we atone for the crimes of our past. It involves making peace with humanity. You can understand if you're emotionally involved in running battles with others, and you harbor resentments, you are perpetually linked to them. It is as if you are spiritually welded to the people that you hate or fight with or resent. And they will probably have a very low spiritual energy, as they may be abusers or predators or aggressive and or arrogant. You can't rise above them until you release them and let them go. In the mirror world, which is the world of feelings and impulses and sentiments, you cannot escape from anyone that you are mentally or emotionally engaged with. Anyone or any group of people that you focus on with your mind and or with resentments and negative emotions. You and they exist in the same place in the mirror world. Imagine it as a neighborhood. You can't fight with people and escape their neighborhood. Almost everyone in the world has a personal story of pain, injustice, romantic upsets and emotional hits that they've taken over the years, as well as the rip-offs and the abuse you might have suffered, and all the times when you got your feelings hurt by others. It's your special story, and you may feel very justified, and you may well have been an innocent victim, but you have to wonder in the overall karma of eternity if there really are any innocent victims. If you believe in reincarnation, there might be an explanation there. It might explain why there seems so much injustice and why you got hurt. Some people feel they're innocent, but if you know the underlying feelings and emotion, you can see how often they wound up others in order to hurt them, or they set themselves up through greed. They would often taunt others in order to create a confrontation. But if you knew the underlying feelings and emotion, you can see how they often taunt others to create a confrontation, or they set themselves up through greed to suffer a loss. But whether you were innocent or guilty, or even partly guilty, or if you brought misfortune on yourself in some obscure way that you don't really understand, all that has to eventually become irrelevant for you now to proceed. Because if you can't make peace with the world, you're stuck. The injustice you feel is part of ancient stored pain, and that is inside of you, and some of it is because of the sins of the father or the mother, pain inherited down through the centuries, unresolved clusters trickling down through history. You will never escape the global karma, or yours, if you're perpetually locked into the energy of your ex-husband or your ex-wife, say, 
or people that you met on this journey through life. Let them go. You have to love your tormentors and offer them every warmth and goodwill that you can manage. For the hellish world is cold and it seeks retribution and vengeance. And all the while heaven is warm and embracing and forgiving. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, is a main new card for the reptile's banquet. It has no spiritual validity at all. Beyond the people you know that you pull to you in this life, you must also release and forgive and forget the karma of your social or tribal cluster. A cluster is a grouping of people, like a native tribe or even the members of the same golf club. It's pockets in the consciousness of humanity that are reflected in the mirror world, where similar mindsets and traditions gather together. So the next liberation is the greater liberation of ditching what you were born with, the cluster. For example, if you were born an African American, you most likely have the injustice of slavery as part of your life story. It'll be in your genes, in your subconscious memory, in the archetypes of your tribal mind. And because of this, you may see the white man as a villain and a tormentor, and you might feel threatened by him. So he sits inside your shadow self. You are the victim. He is the slave trader. But wait a minute. Do any African-American slaves live in your hometown? Were you born a slave? Did you ever meet an African-American slave? Unless you're about 150 years old, you're bound to answer no. So the terrible injustice of slavery is not really a part of your life. It's just a rotten story. The problem is in having white men in your shadow as the enemy. You push away all the white men and women who might help you in this life or give you a hand up. Do you see how the tribal shadow is so destructive that it holds you back spiritually? It's just the same for the Jews. They have their sad stories, and the Palestinian story says how dark and nasty the Jews are. And so the Jews are inside the Palestinian shadow, as the Germans are inside the Jewish shadow, and so forth and so on. But all that terribleness is in the past. You've got to let it go. You have to grant yourself the second liberation, the one that allows you to go beyond your religious, social, tribal, or national karma. You don't need it anymore. And you have to arrive to where you see yourself just as an eternal being, a loving, evolving, spiritual being, not an African or a Jew or a poor, downtrodden Catholic in South America or a disenfranchised woman. It's all story, nothing more, just a story. Some of it isn't even true, but it serves a purpose for unsophisticated people that have not resolved their shadow. They need their special story, and they need the memory of pain that was suffered in the past so they can feel squeaky clean now and holy, so they can garner money and compensation, say, or sympathy, or they can feel they can get some special advantage as a victim, or they can get some special status. Everyone in the cluster is allowed to feel angry all of the time. It's deadly. Because in order to step to another world spiritually, you have to more or less finish with the emotion of this one. I don't mean that you have to die, but you have to resolve the pain, understand it, finish it, stop complaining, and go past it. If not, you die spiritually weak, floundering. You die in the cluster of the wounds of your tribe. And you will drift to that part of the mirror world where wounded Jews are fighting with wounded Muslims. And they are close to all the wounded native people. And over here is a cluster of four million wounded Irish souls, people that died in the famine. And they all have the English in their shadow. And soon you can see how our human evolution is knotted and interlaced. My pain, your pain, the collective Jungian pain. If you can't go beyond it, you're stuffed. You'll float down the pain drain. Where does it lead? I know it's hard to go past the sense of injustice and the rage that certain political and social issues evoke, but we didn't incarnate into a world that is fair. We didn't come to a planet where people are respectful and caring of nature, the animals, or the environment, so the only option is to believe that there is a higher order of beings that watch over and protect things, and they will not allow the planet to fall into absolute degradation and destruction. So that is the third liberation, to see that it's our karma and the planet's karma, the animals and so forth. It is to face injustice and to hold steady knowing there must be a resolution in the end, 
even if we haven't much evidence of it so far. It all exists at a higher level because we exist at a higher level. I think in the end all injustice will be set right and all sadness will melt away. Maybe not in our lifetime, but then again we might be in for a wonderful surprise. There's a group of beings from another world that have recently fought their way into this dimension and we are waiting to see how that will affect things. All is not lost. So the first liberation is to allow all those that have hurt you to go on their way, and the second liberation you let go of any clusters that trap you, and the final liberation is you go beyond the anger and the pain of the terrible injustice suffered by the planet as an organism, and the animals and the general injustices people suffer every day. If you're a sensitive person, the pain of the world will bother you no end. We don't know why there has to be so much pain. It's a lot to do with the evil in our collective human shadow. But all you can do is process yours. You can't let yourself be overwhelmed by the global situation. And if you say to me, but Stewie, I'm a one-eyed Chinese gay male with a wooden leg and I've loads of emotion and pain, and there's Tiananmen Square and the Long March and millions that died in the Cultural Revolution inside my cluster. I can't do bye-bye Beijing right now. I need to clunk around here for a bit longer and work it all out. And I'd say to you, sure, bro, come when you want. There's no rush. Now let me say this, the hidden door beyond enlightenment I speak of is not a mythological place, nor do I speak of it in allegorical terms. It's real, it exists to be found, and I found it and so have many others. Just in case you think I'm kidding, there is a little reference manual that comes with this series, and if you look in there on the first pages you will see some photos of human dematerialization. One was taken at my house in Australia. These photos are of people literally disappearing from this dimension. They are in a sensation we call the morph. In the next session, once I've laid out these introductory ideas, I'll talk a lot more about the world of the morph and how you can access it. It's hard to get a photo of dematerializations as you can't set it up in bright light. You have to kind of fluke the photo at the exact right minute, but they are real and they are part of where this incredible journey has gotten to so far. So when I talk to you about the gap and what lies in there for you to see and experience, just keep an open mind, if you will, and trust me, without ever giving up any of your own reality. And as you go through these CDs, I'll get you there. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, it's a shortcut. You'll have to be a little disciplined and diligently follow me to the end of this series, because if you jump ship in midstream, You'll be like those that sadly wimped out because they didn't have enough strength of will or desire to succeed. You can go beyond the struggle in this life. It comes mostly from the fake you. The authentic you is holy and good and sacred. And by understanding it, you will create your own secret heaven in the roof of the gymnasium of your soul. And you can have your own world and your own title on the shelf. The authentic you, not the fake you. You can agree to be a fringe dweller and silently proud of it. I believe this audio series will help you enormously, not just to see the spiritual being that you are, but also to understand that there is a way of making peace with humanity, even inside what are often very restrictive, controlling systems that have enormous power over you. You can quietly wander off in your mind and your soul and eventually belong to something else. This is not a hypothetical idea, some airy fairy promise, it's real. There's a gap in reality, it's well known and you can walk through the gap to another world. I've taken hundreds of people, maybe a thousand. Trust me, they've all come back safely. They didn't come back the same, but I didn't promise them the same. I promised them different and more free.
I'm not here as another guru teacher trying to convert the masses. What I have to offer is really for just a few people. For those people that are ready to walk away. Those people that are really ready to go beyond transcendence and enlightenment and realize that you don't need it. So this really isn't a philosophy that would ever become like a hundred million strong with rules and dogma and stuff. There's no dogma in my stuff. There's no dogma in the journey beyond enlightenment. It's a very sort of liberating way because you don't have a dogma. So you could say, well, what compels you to teach this stuff? I have a system here and it works. And if you want to come with me and if you've got the courage, you know what they say in English slang, if you've got the bottle to come, I can show you. You can find it yourself. And your inner self, your mirror self, your super knowing or higher self or whatever you want to call it, it knows precisely and exactly how to get you there. Let's go to the next session and I'll talk about the rescue that is here and the one we've seen in the phenomena of the morph and I'll show you how to get there yourself and how that may give you sight of yourself in the mirror world, how that will propel you past the clusters to a higher plane. Come on, let's go to session two. The sun set, you know, this is just after what I was doing. Oh, it's all this red right over here. All the way east, I'm talking dead east too. Seen this light over here all day. Or not all day, all evening, sir. Bring you over here to show you. This is just continuing on with what I was filming over here. Just get not two eventables. Moved it out of the way. Yeah, see. So the second leg over here. So we'll leave it over there and watch that red stuff. Bouncy, bouncy, sorry guys. Oh, yeah, I ruined my damn camera in the first place. 